Brother Steve. <clears throat> well, when I was a kid, um, I used to love uh, to think about what heaven was going to be like. Anybody like me? You ever like to think about what heaven was going to be like, ponder what heaven's going to be like? I, I still vividly remember when I was a kid several conversations uh, that I had um, with family members and with uh, friends of mine talking and just uh, pondering how awesome uh, heaven is going to be, uh, what it's going to be like when we finally get to eternity. And uh, obviously I'm not alone, especially uh, hymn writers, uh, Christian songwriters uh, over the years especially have written song after song uh, about uh, how amazing it's going to be when we get to heaven. For instance, there was the old hymn, When We All Get to Heaven, right? Uh, chorus goes what? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Uh, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, right? And uh, great old hymn, and uh, we praise God for that because we can't wait to see Jesus. And there's also a popular uh, modern Christian song, which you're probably familiar with, uh, entitled, uh, I Can Only Imagine. Similar, similar uh, lyrics it states the chorus, you're probably familiar with it, but it says, Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence or to my knees? Will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. And so, obviously, the songwriter there uh, trying to imagine, imagine the beauty of eternity, uh, which is something, as, as, as I said, I think we've all contemplated, I think, from time to time. But while the actual experience of what heaven is going to be like, while the actual experience of what eternity is going to be like is, is something that we really can only imagine, uh, our Lord, our God, is so gracious in his word to actually give us a glimpse, to give us a glimpse into what it's all going to be like so that we don't just have to imagine, but rather so that we can get this small taste, this little taste of what it's actually going to be like so that we can look forward to it. And, and that's really what our text is all about today. It's, it's all about a look into eternity, a look into eternity. And, uh, and so this text, it essentially gives us a small glimpse into what every single believer in Jesus Christ has to look forward to uh, someday, and it's it's one of, if not my favorite part of Scripture, really. Uh, it's a beautiful text of Scripture. It's it's one that I, I go back to over and over and over again, just devotionally as a way of encouragement. I'd strongly encourage you, if you're in the habit of memorizing Scripture, that uh, Revelation one, or excuse me, twenty one one to six here would be a good one for you to memorize. And uh, because I keep going back to it over and over again, as you can tell, this is only part one of uh, this sermon because I wrote way too much about this particular passage this week and I intended to go a lot farther but uh, I really wanted to give this passage uh, its due. I wanted to give these, the, especially the, these verses but also the entire text uh, the time it deserves and so they're going to get their own sermon uh, of their own for next week so you can look forward to that. But Jumping right in, uh, what will eternity be like according to uh, the scriptures? What are, what are some of the things that this particular text brings out about eternity? Well, point number one, it, in eternity we will enjoy, according to verse one, a new heaven and a new earth. Pick up with me again in verse one. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So last week in uh, chapter 20, specifically in verse 11, we saw that the, that the very presence of the glorified Jesus Christ, we saw how it's going to dissolve the old heaven, the heaven and the earth like snow as the old hymn states. And, and as it says, the, the heaven and earth are going to flee away. And that fleeing away of the old earth and the old heaven was, was done with the purpose of, of making way for what we're reading about here in this completely new creation, this new creation free of the curse, uh, free of the corruption, free of the decay that came as, as a result of sin. And as we all know and as we all experience on a daily basis, sin has indeed affected everything. It has affected all of creation. And because of that, it, it's made the world essentially a really, really dangerous place. A really dangerous place filled with all kinds of threatening things. I mean, we, I mean, we have around us, you know what I mean, threatening animals. I got a lion behind me, right? I mean, you got wild animals. You got, you got poisonous bugs. You have creatures, all kinds of things. You have floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes, and extremes, and heat, and cold, and thorns, and thistles, everything. You get the point, right? Uh, and so the creation is beautiful. I mean, I, you can't doubt that. I mean, God is, God's creation is absolutely magnificent, but, but it is We'd have to, again, be blind, deaf, blind, and dumb to understand that it's not a very safe place. It's a very unsafe place filled with many, 
many, de many deadly hazards. And so, and the Bible talks about this over and over again. We actually sung about it today. Romans chapter 8, verses 19 to 22. It describes the dangers of creation, actually, actually creation groaning. Uh, as a result of the effects of the curse, eagerly longing for the end of this corruption. Romans 8, 19 to 22 says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, uh, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And so very, very clearly, as a result of the fall, as a result of the curse, creation itself is, according to this text, futile. That creation itself is in bondage. It's corrupt and living in pain, waiting for that day that it's set free, that day of that freedom. And, and that freedom, that day of freedom uh, for, for the creation is really what this passage is all about. It's what this verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 1, is all about. According to this text, this corrupted creation will indeed pass away, will be gone, and one day replaced with something beautiful, something amazing, something, as it's described here, new, something completely new. In other words, what is going to happen in this day is that Jesus Christ is going to recreate reality itself. And he's going to recreate reality in order to make it a suitable place for his perfect, redeemed people. And so the new heaven and the new earth is going to be a place that's free of every semblance of sin. Every single effect of the curse whatsoever. Meaning, again, as we saw last week, and we're going to touch on it again in a minute, there's going to be no such thing as death. There's going, to be no, there's going to be no corruption. There's going to be no disease. There's going to be no decay in this, in this new world. There's going to be no more wild and dangerous animals because, again, nature itself is going, to be, is going to be changed. That wild nature is going to be taken from them and replaced with a new nature. The prophet Isaiah, we read about it this morning in the, in the call to worship, and he alluded to that all over and over again throughout uh, the, the book of Isaiah. And he, he said this in Isaiah chapter 11, that when the Messiah returns, Isaiah 11, 6 to 9, he says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leper shall lie down with the young goat and that calf and the lion and the fatted calf together and a little child shall lead them and the cow and the bear shall graze and their young shall lie down together the lion shall eat straw like the ox the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the wean child shall put his hand on the adder's den and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so clearly the entirety of creation is, is going to be remade new. It's going to be completely perfect, including all of the animal life. And what exactly is that going to be like? How exactly are we going to experience it? Well, we can only imagine, right? I mean, we can only imagine it fully. And again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But probably most noticeably, you'll notice that the text also says, it says, and the sea... The sea shall be no more. Uh, it says that there will be a river, that there will be a spring in eternity with the water of life flowing from it. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 22, verse 1 and uh, verse 17. But it clearly says that there will be no sea. And that really tends to bother people. You get into Bible studies with Revelation, and, and they end up coming to that because, again, a lot of people really love the sea, all right? Especially those who really love going to the ocean. And uh, it bothers you because you start asking yourself a question, well, why no sea? And it's a legitimate question to ask as you go to the text. Why no sea in the new heaven and the new earth? Well, again, you study this out, and you go into commentary after commentary, and each one seems to have its own opinion on everything. Um, and you have all kinds of different different opinions, ranging from uh, some that actually believe that this is just a reflection on uh, John being on the island of Patmos, John having a, kind of an assumed hatred of the sea, separating him from everybody. And so he kind of longed for that day when the sea would be no more. And don't know how I really, uh, I don't know if I really buy that particular one, but you also have others who make more scientific arguments that, that our bodies are going to be composed completely differently, and so there's not going to be a need for water to survive, which uh, again, you can, I guess you can make that kind of argument. But personally, though, kind of balancing Scripture against Scripture, I, I believe that the absence of the sea goes back to really why we have a sea, why, why we have an ocean in the first place, namely because of what we talked about this morning during uh, our Sunday school hour, namely because of the Genesis flood. 
And we have to remember that, that the reason why we have oceans, the oceans around us that we do today, is because God literally, he flooded the entire earth during the time of Noah in the book of Genesis. And, and again, while the ocean, while, while the sea, while it does have beauty to them, they're ultimately, you've got to remember, they're ultimately a reminder of God's judgment. They're ultimately a reminder of, of sin. And that judgment is seen today practically uh, as the seas really, when you think about it, have become a really big part uh, of the curse. And, and as a matter of fact, I would argue that uh, they're probably one of the most intimidating and probably most dangerous parts of creation. And it creates a lot of problems for human beings living on this planet, really, when you start delving deep and thinking about it. I mean, what is, what is the ocean? I mean, it makes the ocean, it makes travel, you know, very, very difficult. Right? It makes commerce very, very dangerous. And you can't really live on the ocean forever without having to come to land. So it really, there's no natural place to live out there. Uh, oceans, they also they create natural, uh, natural borders, which again, uh, it, it makes it really hard for peace in the world to reign because again, you're just going to have misunderstandings because of the cultures that just the distance is going to create. And so, so the oceans themselves, I mean, they, they, they're not really a help to the creation, but rather a part of that curse. But again, the absence of the ocean or the sea is going to mean the removal of all of that, the removal of, of this kind of chaos, the removal of this kind of danger and separation that kind of characterizes our church or, or our earth uh, right now, as well as the removal of, of that kind of reminder of God's punishment uh, of sin at that particular time. And so in the new heaven and the new earth, there's, there's never, ever going to be this reminder of a punishment of sin because all of the punishment will be gone. There will, be, there will be no punishment ever again, all because of Jesus Christ, which the absence of the sea here demonstrates. And so the absence of the sea is the ultimate sign that God is never, ever going to destroy his creation ever again because everything will be made new and perfect. But you then have verse 2 that says, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so here we see in verse 2, John then sees this, and we're going to get into this more in the coming weeks, this holy city, this new Jerusalem descending down uh, out of heaven. And, uh, and again, as we're going to see in the, in the second half of the chapter, the city, again, is not ultimately a physical place, but rather a people, uh, namely the redeemed, as it brings out here, Christ's bride. It's talking about the church here, beautifully prepared for her husband upon his return, Lord Jesus Christ. And again, that imagery of a wedding, we've seen it throughout the entirety of the book of, of Revelation. It signifies the intimacy that we're going to have with God uh, in this day, the joy and that eternal union with God, as well as all of the relational aspects that, that eternity is going to mean for us as God's people. Again, we've seen this wedding imagery before. Chapter 19, verses 6 to 8, it says this. Remember, we went through those four hallelujahs throughout that chapter. John says, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so in this new heaven, in this new earth, it's, it's going to be yet another sign that the bridegroom, it's going to be a sign of his love for us as his people, for his bride. And again, not only has our bridegroom, according to chapter 19, clothed us and made us new with this bright, fine linen, again, signifies that perfect sinless state that we're going to live in, but he also is preparing this place, this beautiful new Jerusalem, this place of perfection for us to dwell with him for all eternity. And Jesus alluded to this during his earthly ministry over and over again. Beautifully, we have in John 14, 2 to 3, he said, in my father's house are many what? Many rooms, many mansions, some of your translations might say. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And amen to that, right? Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. And, and again, we're going to talk about the, this new Jerusalem, this physical new Jerusalem a little bit more when we get there. But uh, that intimacy that God's people are going to enjoy is what this imagery of a marriage, this intimacy of a wedding and why it's used throughout Revelation, as, as well as what we see emphasized in the next verse and point number two, that in eternity we will enjoy the intimate and the eternal presence of God. Take a look at verse three once again. It said this, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be 
his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And so with God's people, again, referring to Christ's bride now made completely new, as well as the new heavens and the new earth, the all of creation being made completely new, there will finally be a place that is worthy enough for God himself to call his dwelling place. There will finally be a place where God can call home. And so in order, in order to understand this, we have to also remember who God is and what God is. We have to remember first and foremost that God is perfect. God is the only sinless being that there is. He is sinless, completely and utterly perfect. And John said this of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 John 3, 5, he said, In him, speaking of God, God the Son, there is no sin. Meaning this is that the only place that would be fit for God himself to call home would be a place where there is absolutely no sin whatsoever, which is exactly what the new Jerusalem will be. And later on in verse 27, he makes that very, very clear. We'll look at this when we get there, but in verse 27 of chapter 21 about the new Jerusalem, he says, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so, and so the fact that God himself will now dwell where the, the fact that God will now make his, his home in this new creation is just a testimony to how amazingly perfect uh, this new creation, this new Jerusalem will be. But it, but it also is a testimony to how perfect we will be, okay? Those of us who have been redeemed by the Lord, those whom God dwells with. In other words, in other words it's a testimony to just how new, to just how sinless that we will personally be when we finally get to heaven if you are in Jesus Christ today. You notice verse 3 continues. It says, the dwelling place of God is with who? It's with man. And he will dwell with them. That's an amazingly powerful verse. And especially when you start delving into what that word dwelling means. The dwell or, or dwell. It's a very interesting Greek word. It's actually the, the term skeno, which actually can be translated as tabernacle. It's a very, very unique word here in the text. And again, this is where we need to know our Bibles and, and understand that so much of Revelation goes back to the Old Testament. Don't unhitch your wagon from the Old Testament ever because there's so much. Uh, I mean, it's the foundation of the entire Bible. And again, you go back to the Old Testament where God made his dwelling again in that, in that tabernacle, specifically in that special room known as the Holy of Holies. And again, as the Israelites would make their way through the promised land, they would set up this tabernacle and they would go and worship there. And, and again, as you study out the Holy of Holies, you know that not just anybody could enter into the presence of God in that holy room. Only certain priests at certain times could, could, could enter into God's presence. Otherwise, that there would be very severe consequences. And so, due to, to God's perfection, due to God's sinlessness, his holiness, sinful man... We just can't fully enjoy God's intimate presence. We can enjoy his presence now to a certain degree, but we can't enjoy it fully. And so there always has to be an intermediary between God and man in order to have any kind of relationship with him. It's, it, whether it's the tabernacle, whether it's the temple, whether it's the priesthood or, or some other method, because God cannot make his dwelling place. He cannot make his home in a cursed creation. And he cannot make his dwelling place with sinful people. However, this got to remember this, because Christ, in, at this point in future history, has now perfectly remade both creation and completely transformed his people. He can now enjoy unfettered and intimate and eternal personal communion with man. Amen? <laughs> Amen. And again, with man is where God's tabernacle, with man, with perfect sinless man. That's how much God is going to transform you if you are in Jesus Christ. With man, God will make his tabernacle, will make his dwelling place. God's home will be with you and with me now and forevermore. And if you are in Jesus Christ today, let me tell you that that fact, that this fact that you're going to enjoy this kind of closeness with God is, is a testimony to just how amazing your salvation actually is, believer. When God saved you, you have to understand this. When he gave you that faith in Jesus Christ, when he caused you to be born again, he also made a promise to transform you completely. And it's not just the absence of death, but it's, it's, it's to make you completely and utterly sinless, to make you completely new so that you can enjoy this perfect dwelling place. You can enjoy this perfect communion with your God for all eternity. Meaning this is that if you're in Christ, that all of your struggles with sin, and every single one of us has them today, all of your struggles with sin that makes God oftentimes feel like he is at a distance, Every single one of your failures, all, all the times when you have completely blown it spiritually are all one day going to be a thing of the past. Amen? 
<laughs> Amen, right? You know, our sin, it's amazing. It's like, you ever, you ever fall into sin and then it just makes you feel like God is a million miles away, like he's on the other side of the ocean? Believer, in eternity, you're never going to feel that way again. Ever. Why? Because all your failures are going to be a thing of the past. All your sins are going to literally be as far as the east is from the west, all because of Jesus Christ. And that's what this passage does. It gives us hope that one day we will never, ever feel like God is at a distance ever again. And why is that? Well, because we will be made so completely new. We will be made so completely perfect. We will be so, so sinless that God's eternal presence will be the proof of that. That, we, that he will actually make his dwelling place, his home, with you and me. Amen? Amen. Praise God. And the proof of this level of intimacy with God, this future level of intimacy, is seen as with what we read in the next verse, verse 4, point number 3, that in eternity, there will be no more tears. There's going to be no more crying, no mourning, no pain, and no death. Read with me verse 4 again. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I think I've shared this story with you before, but I remember one time a little boy came up to me and said, Pastor, what do you think the best part about heaven is going to be? What do you think the best part about heaven is going to be? And without skipping a beat, I brought him to this text. And I told him that besides the thrill of being with Jesus Christ, who is our reward, I think that the best part about heaven is that we're never going to have a reason to cry ever again. I think that's going to be one of the best parts, because why do we cry? Why do we cry? Well, yeah, sometimes there's tears of joy, right? But even those tears of joy are often rooted in some kind of pain because we've experienced some kind of pain. In other words, we cry because something hurt us. It's usually what it is. Maybe it's physical pain, right? You, know, you have unbearable pain, right? Uh, you cry as a result of that. Maybe it's more often than not, it's emotional pain, right? Maybe it's somebody hurt your feelings, said something to you, or, or maybe it's loss of a friend or a relationship or, or, or something like that. The point is, is that crying is, is that outward reflection of our inward sadness, of our grief that we are dealing with. That's what crying is. But according to this text, in eternity, there's going to be no more tears anymore. There's going to be no more crying because there's going to be absolutely no reason to be grieved. There's going to be no grief. There's going to be no sadness in heaven. And why is that? Well, first and foremost, we'll be with Jesus, who is our joy. We sung about it to this morning. But also, one of the other reasons is, is that, as we talked about last week, as this verse states, that death shall be no more in heaven. And again, I mentioned last week, whether we want to admit it or not, that so much of our lives revolve around death, right? We eat to avoid dying. We clothe ourselves to avoid dying, right? Time is essentially a countdown to death. And death always brings with it what? It always, always brings with it tears. Death always brings with it mourning and crying and pain. And this is the reason why this life is filled with tears, ultimately because of death. But again, we've already read this in chapter 20. One day, Jesus is going to eliminate death. One day, Jesus is going to eliminate death. He's going to cast it into the lake of fire, as we've seen in the last passages. And at the very same time, Jesus himself is going to wipe away every single tear from each and every single one of our eyes. And so as Jesus recreates this world, this new heaven and the new earth, he's going to fashion it. This, this, this perfect new creation, he's going to fashion it in such a way as there will be absolutely no reason to cry whatsoever because he will have eliminated the greatest reason why we all shed tears, and that is death. That is death. And again, making this promise even more amazing. Again, this is a reason why we have to study out this passage because it's so tied to the Old Testament prophecy. Dan mentioned it this morning at the call to worship that oftentimes, in especially Old Testament prophecy, there's dual and maybe sometimes try meanings to them. And that's why you see a lot of that in the prophet Isaiah. But you see this promise all going all the way back once again to the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 8, where, where Isaiah wrote this about the Messiah. He said, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all of the earth for the Lord has spoken. 
And so again, we see here that this wiping away of all the tears of, of his people is a promise that God has made over and over and over again and that he will personally make happen, which I think is, is seen uh, in Revelation 21. As John, you'll notice that he uses personal pronouns. Not just God will do it, but, he no, but notice that he uses the term he. He will wipe away your tears. Meaning this, is who is that referring to? It's referring to Jesus. It's referring to Jesus himself. He will be the one wiping away all of our tears. Meaning this, it's so beautiful, such a beautiful text. Because it means this, is that Jesus loves and cares for us as his people. He, he loves and cares for us as his bride so much, as this text calls us. That he is even concerned with the way that we feel. That our God is concerned with our emotions. It means that, it means that Jesus, the spiritual husband, he doesn't want his bride to mourn anymore. He doesn't want his bride to cry or be in pain and to shed tears to the point where he himself is going to wipe away those tears personally from her eyes. And folks, this is so, so very important because of the fact that it shows that if you are in Jesus Christ today, it shows how much Jesus Christ loves you personally. Amen? He loves you, Christian. He loves you. And he loves you so much that he doesn't want to see you brokenhearted. He doesn't want to see you depressed. He doesn't want to see you in pain. And he loves you so much to the point where one day he's going to fix it all. He's going to make it all new. He's going to make it all right. And the fact that Jesus is going to wipe away your tears personally just shows just how amazing of a God we have just how caring and kind and deep his love for us is as Christians. And so I just hope that you bear that in mind. When you read this text, you realize the depths of the love that Jesus Christ has for you if you're in him today. And that one day he's going to wipe away every one of those tears. And no matter what you are going through today, and I know that there are so many things going on in our lives today, that one day those things are going to be finally over and Jesus is going to make them all new and he's going to make them right. And so bear that in your heart today, believer. Amen? Amen. Keep that truth close to your hearts. But finally, point number four today. In eternity, we will also experience God's word to its fullness. Notice verse five. And we're only going to get through about half of uh, verse six today. We'll come back to it next week. But verse five, it says, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this down. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so first we see Jesus there, once again, seated on his throne, declaring, Behold, I am making all things new. And again, we've already looked at this. We're going to look at it again next week. This isn't just a restoration, but this is a complete transformation. This is a complete recreation of creation itself and his people. And again, God's power, his authority are on display as he renews everything, everything in the universe, everything in the cosmos. This recreation takes place by his power. But interestingly, you'll notice here, I kind of zeroed in on this. You'll notice that the command that was given to him, given to John here to do what? To write this down. Write this down. In other words, God commanded John here to make a record of these truths so that each and every single Christian in the future would know this promise, would know that this promise that Jesus is going to make all things new will certainly happen. It's there in black and white. In other words, God himself told John very plainly to make this book of Revelation a part of the Bible, which again underscores the reliability and the certainty of every single one of these beautiful end times promises that we are going to look at in the last couple chapters here. And again, we have to remember that the fact that God commands John to make this a part of his written word means that every single part of the book of Revelation is just as, he, he uses the term trustworthy and true. Everything in Revelation is just as trustworthy and true as any other part of the Bible. Meaning this is that I know a lot of times we get into some of the deeper theology of, of, of Revelation, all of this eschatology, and it gets confusing, right? And there's a lot of debates about it, okay? And, and, and it just, Revelation's a tough book. But we have to understand that no matter how confusing it might be, that these are are indeed God's word, and so they should not be diminished in any form or fashion, okay? And I say this personally to myself, kind of an application to myself, because, because personally speaking, I'm just going to share with you one of the reasons why I, I chose to do the book of Revelation, to preach through this about a year ago, over a year ago now, is because I, I felt personally that I was minimizing part of the Bible. I was minimizing this 
part of the Bible. And I, and I would use the excuse that there's a lot of debate about this book and that eschatology, eschatology end time study is kind of a secondary doctrine and that it's not really as important as other parts of the Bible. But I'm going to be perfectly honest with you this morning that, that the reason ultimately for not wanting to preach and study Revelation is a lot to do with fear. A lot to do with fear, maybe a little laziness not to want to dig into all of the, the commentaries because the commentaries are about yay high, right? But again, it was, it was a lot of fear in my heart to study these kind of things. But again, I had to come back to the truth that Revelation, the book of Revelation, is just as much a part of God's word as Romans or Hebrews or the Gospel of Matthew. And, and so it needs to be treated as such. And again, I was convicted that I personally as a pastor, as, as a teacher of God's word, was actually lessening the importance, in my heart anyways, of a huge part of God's holy and trustworthy and true word. Again, I, I was convicted because my attitude towards revelation was pretty much the same as somebody who might deny Genesis. Right? We talked about denying a literal Genesis this morning during, during Sunday school. And so, no, I wasn't openly denying what God's word says, kind of like what those what, what, you know, people who deny Genesis do. But, but I was basically saying that revelation wasn't important. Revelation is not as important, not as important as any other book of Scripture. And folks, that is absolutely wrong attitude to approach any part of Scripture. And why is that wrong? Because of this. Because, because if we lessen the importance of one part of the Bible, we can do it with other parts. If we lessen the, the importance of Revelation, we can do that with all kinds of other teachings, right? We can do that with Genesis. We can do that with, with other teachings of the Scripture, the virgin birth and the Trinity and, and, and the resurrection and all of those kind of things. And folks, I think that that kind of reductionism of the scriptures themselves, it has, it has devastating effects on the local church because ultimately it undermines the sufficiency and it undermines the authority that the Bible must have in the life of the local church. Because again, once we've abandoned the Bible, once we've abandoned the authority and the sufficiency of scripture, what are we? You know, we're nothing but a community club, right? It's all that we are. We're not a church if we abandon the scriptures. And so the point that I want to get at today is don't diminish God's word in any part, believer. As a matter of fact, uh, later on in chapter 22, John's going to give one last warning. Don't add or take away from the pages of this book. And yeah, he's talking about Revelation, but he's talking about the entirety of Scripture. Don't diminish, don't add to or diminish any part of Scripture. Every page, according to this word, is trustworthy and true from Genesis to Revelation. In the Bible, again, we have all of God's word. He uses the term alpha and omega. Alpha and omega there is just the, 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 the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Okay, And so we have every word of God, every letter of the word of God, meaning that every single word, every single letter, every single, as the old King James put it, every single jot and tittle of the word of God is his word inspired word. Matthew 5, 18 said this. Again, the old King James said, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. And of course, jot and tittle refers to the smallest and largest letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So you have the Greek New Testament and the Hebrew Old Testament. Meaning this, is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament, Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books, all 1,189 chapters in the entirety of the scripture is God's holy word. And they are all equally important. And they're all equally important. Why? Because each and every single Alpha and Omega, each and every single jot and tittle points to the Alpha and Omega, points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 6. It says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Meaning this, is that everything in the Bible, everything in this book will be done. And it will be done. How do we know that? Well, because from beginning to end of all of its pages and from the beginning of end of history, it all points to one person, and that is Jesus Christ. Every page of Scripture points to Christ. Everything that has been, is, or will transpire will do so for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it will ultimately culminate in these beautiful promises, beautiful promises of heaven, beautiful promises of eternity and eternal life that we read of in this text. And so the application for us this morning is to never, ever diminish any part of God's Word any part of God's word, because why? Because one day, you and I, if you are in him today, are going to experience it to its fullest. One day, you're, we're going to see just how done it is. Okay? When Jesus, when this Alpha and the Omega returns and makes good on every single one of those promises. And so again, as we conclude today, this first part of our look into eternity, my prayer is that you wouldn't just imagine what it's going to be like, but that you would be encouraged by what God's word says it's actually going to be like. That you would rejoice in the fact that, that if you are in Christ, that all of creation, 
that, that all of the heavens, all of the, the earth, including yourself, by the way, will all be made new one day, free of sin, free of death, free of, free of decay, free of the curse. I pray that that would be encouragement to you. I pray that, that, that you would rejoice in, in that, that intimate and that eternal presence of God as he makes his dwelling place with man. He makes us that tabernacle to be with us and to enjoy him forever as his, as his chosen people, as his bride. And I pray that you would look forward to that day when you live in a reality where there's going to be no more tears. That day when there's going to be no reason to cry ever again. He's going to wipe them all away. There's going to be no mourning. There's going to be no pain. There's going to be no death anymore that we look forward to that. And finally, I would pray that until that day that we would never, ever, ever diminish one letter of God's authoritative word. But especially these beautiful promises in Revelation. Amen? Amen. And so, amen to that. Come back next week as we get into part two of our look into eternity. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this word. Lord, what a beautiful, beautiful text, Lord. What a beautiful text. Well, Lord, it's, it's hard to even do it justice. Uh, it's hard to uh, just wrap your head around what all of these verses, just these short little five and a half verses, six, six and a half verses, God, the truths that they bring out. It's so hard to imagine, but Lord, we thank you that they're included. We thank you, God, for your, your amazing, powerful word. And Lord, I thank you for the promises that it makes that one day we will be with you that we will be with you in that new heaven, that new earth, that you're going to wipe away every tear from our eyes, that you're going to eliminate death. And God, that one day we are going to, we are going to glorify you in the way that you deserve as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so, Lord, we look forward to that day. Come quickly, Lord. But in the meantime, help us to be busy for you. Help us to honor you, Lord, with our thoughts and actions and attitudes. Lord, may you get all of the glory for it all. We love you, and we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen.